right, everyone, welcome to the next session in track two. I'm Debbie Lukenbill, and I'm from Mobius, and we are hosting this section, um, this track. And we also want to give a big shout out to Equinox, who is sponsoring our closed captioning. And thank you to our awesome captioner, who's doing a great job. Um, I'd like to introduce Jessica Wolford, Amy Trelaga, and Carol Yarrison, who are going to be presenting on the topic of Open Sesame, creating stricter evergreen login requirements for staff and patrons. Take it away. Hey, Debbie, can you uh, un uh, allow me to share my video? <laughs> I'll just go with this. Yeah, try now. Okay, thanks, Debbie. Mm -hmm. Nope. That's okay. You. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> that's weird. It keeps telling me that uh, I can't do it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see um, the whole slideshow and oh yeah yeah no i can share the screen i just i could i can't turn on my video oh uh, <laughs> hmm. yeah that's for me too i'm assuming carol <laughs> okay let me see if i can figure this out <laughs> just a second we need a technical difficulty slide yeah <laughs> <laughs> I can still start talking even though you can't see me. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm going to go ahead. Oops. Okay, you should be able to do it now. Thank you. Yes. That's not what I wanted to do. Yay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> all right, uh, so here we go. So welcome to our presentation. I'm Jessica Wolford and uh, joining me are Amy Terlaga and uh, Carol Yarrison. Both, uh, all of us are from Bibliomation. And weirdly, this is like my whatever time presenting at the conference. And this is the first time I've presented with my, my coworkers. So this is a momentous day. <laughs> Um, so if you don't know about uh, Bibliomation, uh, if you've been around, you've probably heard of us by now, but uh, we are Connecticut's largest library consortium. Uh, we're also a very diverse library consortium. We have 63 public libraries ranging in size from uh, urban multi-library system with, you know, several branches and um, from tiny little rural libraries, one of which doesn't even have a bathroom. Um, we also have seven K through 12 school libraries, and we have three special uh, libraries, which are uh, kind of a new, a new thing for us. We have two that don't circulate any materials. Uh, one of them is a historical society. The other one is a, um, a maritime museum. Uh, and the other one is a, a that does that does circulate is a church library. So all very uh, very unique situations. <laughs> uh, so first thing I wanted to talk about is why did we feel the need to change the way that we were handling staff and patron logins? Well, the first thing that uh, that was happening was that as we were talking and gearing up to switch over to the web clients our libraries started to be really concerned about the security of accessing the web client. Uh, you know, they're thinking if I just have, can click on this URL and log in and start using the system, um, what protections are there going to be in place to make sure that, um, you know, not anybody can, can do that. 
Uh, and they also were starting to, we were starting to get a lot of questions about patron privacy at the same time. And uh, because of, of all of the, um, you know, leaks and things that were happening, um, people getting into different, uh, different systems to get personal information from, from people. Uh, so there was, there was a big concern about that. Um, and uh, most notably, uh, we had been using the sh same shared staff logins with everybody having the same password uh, for at least two decades. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it was, as Victor Hugo says in the quote that I have appeared, this was an idea whose time had come. <laughs> and uh, we, we really needed to, to make some changes. And uh, why not uh, before we moved over to the web client seemed like a good, uh, a good reason as any to uh, change our practices. So what were our goals going into this project? Um, we wanted all library staff, uh, instead of using the uh, shared logins, we wanted them to switch to using individual logins. So um, if Joe Smith works at um, Bethel Public Library, we wanted Joe Smith to have his own username, own login that even his coworkers didn't know the password for. Um, so that if he, he left and went to another location or, um, you know, just didn't work at the library anymore, we could just delete that account or, you know, change the password and uh, he wouldn't have access to, to that account anymore. Um, we also wanted to change the way that we handle permission groups. Um, and because we only had like two or three shared logins per library, uh, we kind of had a, a had a um, an approach that we that all of the the users had pretty much the same permissions. It wasn't even though they were kind of uh, the username was kind of done by by name or by function of of the login. Um, really, because we have such small libraries where everybody does everything, we couldn't just make those um, a circ or a cataloging login only. Um, and we wanted to change that. We wanted to make it so that if you were a CERC person, you got CERC permissions, but not necessarily cataloging permissions and vice versa. If you were a technical services person, but didn't really do anything with CERC, uh, we wanted to make sure that you did, you had uh, permissions that were appropriate for what you've been trained on and for your job. Um, and we also decided uh, to kind of ramp up the security a little bit to actually only give the register permission uh, or register workstation permission to a select few in the library so that there were only a few people who could register workstations. We figured they wouldn't really need to do that very often unless they got a new equipment or they were you know, switching from Zool over to the, to the web client. Um, those are instances where they might need it. But um, in general, you're not going around registering a lot of workstations. So that kind of prevented staff from being able to go home and log in and, and look things up where they might not have wanted their staff to be able to do that. Nowadays, in uh, the post-COVID world, <laughs> we have relaxed that a bit because we do have library staff that are working from home. Um, so we did give that, that permission out to uh, at least the higher tiered um, staff user accounts. Um, and we also wanted to uh, create uh, an ability for if, if staff had the, the desire to do this to manage their own staff user accounts. Um, so there's a, only a few select individuals in the library that can do things like, you know, change um, permission groups and um, register new uh, staff accounts and delete staff accounts. Uh, we also uh, wanted to try and, and change the way that we handle passwords. Uh, so we wanted uh, all of our users and all of our staff and our patrons to have a minimum 12 character password. Uh, and this was um, something that was heralded by John Merriam, who is our uh, Evergreen System Specialist at the time. Um, and uh, you know, we really wanted to stop using the, we had been using the uh, four digit, uh, last four digits of the telephone as the default password. 
Um, but we kind of, we wanted to get get away from that and uh, make things a little bit more secure for for patrons and for staff. Uh, we wanted to roll out these changes in stages uh, for the libraries. Instead of cutting everybody over at once, we figured that would be too big of a load on help desk and uh, also too um, confusing for the libraries to do all at once. Uh, so we wanted to be able to kind of do this in a managed way. And we wanted to get this all over, all done before we uh, started using the web client. <laughs> and we also wanted to get it done before I gave birth. <laughs> uh, I, had, I had a lot of, uh, of projects that uh, we wanted to get done before then, uh, one of which was an upgrade, uh, another one of, of which was this. Um, and we started this project in uh, June of uh, 2018, I believe. And um, I was due uh, March 25th of 2019. Uh, so we wanted to at least get the prep so that I could just hand it off to everybody and be like, okay, here you go. I'm going to go have a baby now. <laughs> All right. So the way that we started uh, doing, it, doing this is we did an analysis on what permissions did all staff need? What do only some of them need? Uh, and that was handled by our handy dandy color coded spreadsheet. <laughs> so we actually, um, I did some a SQL query to find out, um, find the, per, the user permission map and kind of uh, coded that, uh, joined uh, uh, the, the permissions table so that you could see what the permissions actually were. And we had several meetings uh, with uh, the cataloging specialist department and um, the uh, sort of more circulation focused departments and um, went through everything and decided what was going to be a permission that would be only for, you know, say an ACK user versus what was a permission that kind of everybody needed. Uh, so the blue stuff is stuff that we decided that everybody kind of needed. Uh, and there, was a there were a few things that we decided that nobody needed <laughs> and could just be done handled by the consortium staff. And I think those would just be in white. Uh, actually, no, the admins, I'm sorry, I, I got that wrong. Uh, so the blue stuff is all administrator stuff. So this is stuff that just went to, um, you know, the, the consortium staff. And then uh, we've got the green is catalogers, the yellow is circulators. We did highlight some stuff that needed testing. And did we highlight the ones where, yeah. So the white stuff is the stuff that we decided that everybody needed, yeah. So that is a, a public link. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can certainly go through, through that for some light reading if you need to fall asleep later. Um, all right, I'm gonna go back to presenting. All right, so then we wanted to know, oops, sorry. What about, we, we, these are some of the questions that we came up with when we were trying to figure out how to do this. Um, what about small libraries where everybody does everything or tech services staff uh, where you know, that also work at the CERC desk, you know, or cover the CERC desk occasionally? Uh, well, we decided that if you needed both cataloging and CERC permissions, uh, we would give you uh, two separate permission groups. So we would use the secondary permission groups feature to give you any additional permissions that you might need to do your job. Uh, another question that, uh, that we came up with, well, what about uh, volunteers or part-timers who only need limited permissions? Um, and uh, we didn't really know, you know what libraries considered limited in terms of permissions. So we sent out a survey to figure that out. And what we found out was that everybody has a different definition of what limited meant. So what we decided to do with that is um, we 
created a, we already had a restricted staff permission group tree. So we created uh, limited groups based on with the responses that the libraries gave us from the surveys. And so we gave permissions uh, to those groups based on, based on what the libraries wanted uniquely. And we decided to handle everything with permission groups instead of us uh, allowing staff to assign or grant um, permissions to users individually. There is that ability in Evergreen, um, but we decided that it would be kind of easier for us to manage, to assign permission groups um, instead of assigning individual permissions. And we also decided that it would be easier for the libraries to understand uh, than to be looking through that big uh, permissions list, which we had already done, and, uh, and assign those and grant things uh, as, as needed. Uh, and then uh, this was, I apologize to the closed captioners, because this was something I thought of later on that we didn't mention in our original uh, uh, presentation. Um, so what do we do about, what, what are we gonna do about the old user accounts that were, sh those shared user accounts that we decided were insecure and not, uh, we weren't gonna use going forward? Uh, well, we decided that once the staff had had a chance to really test their stuff, we were going to merge them with the, with the new user account. And the account that we would merge the old accounts with would be chosen by the libraries. I think Amy is gonna talk about that more in her her part, uh, but I wanted to mention it here as well. Um, so this is a an, a picture from the GUI, the Evergreen uh, staff client GUI, um, of what our old staff account uh, tree looked like. Uh, it was kind of, we kind of were still using the stock thing that shipped with Evergreen with a couple of things that we added that were custom, like this, uh, the media specialist um, group. But we were really only using four of these. So we were using acquisitions, cataloger, circulator, and uh, media specialist. So we decided to keep that tree active for, um, while we were transitioning over so that staff could use their shared account logins at the same time as they were kind of getting used to using their, their new account logins. We've also, uh, so this is our, what we ended up with our new tree. So uh, as I said, as mentioned before, when we were going through the list, some of those permissions are st still fall under the, um, the regular staff umbrella. And uh, for the rest of them, these are just sort of, these are unique groups that have unique uh, permissions. Uh, and the way that we accomplish that is we kind of took, we had, uh, for most of our, our permissions were kind of inherited from uh, on, the, on the previous slide, uh, the staff accounts group there. So what, what I ended up doing was doing some SQL to copy over all of those permissions into the regular staff tree and uh, allow, and just kind of took away stuff. Actually, I did that for most of these groups. Um, I you did that for acquisitions, catalog, or circulation. And uh, though the exceptions to that and, and the school library staff, we decided we didn't want to have um, we didn't want them to be using secondary permission groups since uh, their job is very, they do everything at their library. So we wanted them to, to make it kind of simple, as simple for them as we possibly could. Um, so school library staff have all the permissions that they've ever had and uh, everybody else has more unique um, stuff. So it, it, it was easier to kind of copy all of the permissions that they had and take stuff away uh, than to kind of start from scratch because there are so many permissions. Um, the uh, exceptions to that were the, the, these new groups, the local user admin and the local workstation admin because they only really needed, they were, they, these were gonna be sort of add-on permissions anyway and they only really needed certain um, types of permissions uh, for those particular user groups. 
Uh, and we did, with testing those, kind of figure out what the minimum was. <laughs> um, oops, sorry. And uh, for the restricted tree, this used to be its own tree. Uh, it, was, it was kind of separate, kind of under the user's umbrella. But uh, we ended up having to move it under the new staff accounts umbrella uh, because uh, we found out that um, the way that our hold rules are written, we could not place holds, uh, or these, these users could not place holds uh, unless they were, uh, unless we were adding completely new rules to the, to the system. Uh, we, we wanted kind of make it as simple as we possibly could for that, so we put them under the new staff accounts umbrella and um, made this kind of subtree very limited in what the circulations that it had and, but I kind of used the same approach in copying the permissions over and then taking away what the libraries didn't want these users to be able to do. And in order to make this work, uh, I added two new permissions so that, um, so that staff could add new people to these groups. Um, and those permissions were, are listed here, if you're interested. So um, following all of this analysis, we did some in-house testing with the consortium staff uh, when we treated it like an upgrade um, without any of the new features, so without the fun stuff. Um, but we tested all of the functions, checking things in, checking things out, um, adding items, and um, we kind of had each department focus on um, on their their specialty, so uh, and that went that went pretty well. We found a lot of things that uh, that needed to be updated based on that testing. Uh, we added some new permissions so that they, the accounts could function properly. Um, and uh, for, through the testing, we also found out that we needed to add hold rules for those new accounts so that they could place holds on behalf of patrons. Uh, and we identified some permissions that were missing. All right, and so I'll turn it over to you, Amy. <laughs> Jessica? Hi, everybody. Uh, you know, I wanted to start by saying that there's a Brady Bunch episode that um, you, if you watch Brady Bunch, you might remember it. Marsha Brady had to make some kind of a presentation, and she was really uh, anxious about it. And um, her brother um, suggested that she picture the audience um, in their underwear. <laughs> so I'm finding that it's, this is even better because you don't see the audience. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of freeing, so. <laughs> Uh, uh, all right, so testing, testing, testing. Uh, what, what we wanted to do is to, before we started rolling this out to all of the libraries on mass, we wanted to make sure that it, it was gonna work. Um, so we approached five libraries and um, they ranged in size. You know, we had a, a, a good mix of small, medium, large. They, um, we, they were chosen because um, we wanted to make sure that they would give us good feedback. And what's not on this slide, which I, I should have added to the slide, is we also chose them because we knew these libraries would roll with the punches. If we didn't get things exactly right and there were hiccups along the way, um, these libraries we knew would, uh, would not um, freak out on us, <laughs> basically. And so I think that's even more important, um, yeah, in dealing with um, libraries and testing. And, and then we call them uh, individually to um, talk about expectations and, and the process. What, what did we want them to do? And why did we want them to do it? So um, next slide, just. Um, so what did, oh, oh, back one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, what we uh, discussed with each test library is 
Okay, so how did they need their user login set up? That was probably the most important question. Uh, we needed to make sure that we were accounting for everybody at the library and that their permissions were, would do for them what they needed them to do. And um, if you click on the link, Jessica will just show um, that actually Jessica came up with a very nice um, summary of what the accounts would do. So this is what the libraries referred to when they were trying to decide who needed what. Uh, and if you scroll down just a smidge, um, you can see there the, the acquisition staff, the cataloger staff, you know, circulation staff, what what permissions in a broad way. I mean we didn't list out every single you know permission, um, but uh, it gave them a sense of you know what they should be um, signing up for. Okay, and okay. Okay, and also we, we talked a little bit about did they want to manage their own staff accounts, you know, add accounts, delete accounts, that sort of thing, um, or did they want us to manage it? Um, even though we talked about it, oh, I would have to say that the majority of our libraries um, want us to, to manage it. And so um, since we've switched them over to these individual accounts, um, I'd say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, there's a bit of activity there because what I didn't realize was how many, um, how many times their staff turn over at libraries. We, I mean, we just didn't realize it. So, so it's, you know, we're, we're, we're creating accounts for libraries and we're deleting accounts on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, we also um, wanted to know who was going to register the workstations. And I think Jessica mentioned this, but we, we, we left it to, to just two um, per library because it is a security issue. Um, and uh, so, I mean, yes, there are some protections and if somebody quits, you know, the library is supposed to inform us so we can delete the account. But um, just the, the, that ability to register workstations would mean that, you know, they could, you know, go home theoretically and register. Um, so, uh, and also who at the library would receive historical data from the current staff accounts, which um, happened when we merged uh, old accounts into the new accounts. And, and then, of course, the setup of limited circulator uh, accounts as needed. And, um, and there's a handful of libraries that use these limited circulator accounts to, um, for, for staff. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the very basic form that was used um, with the libraries to figure out uh, what, what it is they, they wanted. And, um, and it worked very well. I, you know, there, there weren't too many times where it's like, oh no, that's not what we you know, were expecting to get out of this by filling out the form. Um, next slide. Okay, once the staff account forms were received um, from the five test libraries, the new accounts were created. Um, we also generated these passwords um, for the libraries to use with the staff accounts. Um, which with the understanding that they, they could change them if they found that it was um, too um, not memorable. <laughs> um, but we, we found where a, a lot of the libraries just held on to the, the, the random passwords that we had given them. Um, and what they were, uh, it's um, John Miriam, which um, Jessica had mentioned earlier, who uh, was working in the Evergreen department, he had, he had, does some programming. And so he had come up with his own random password generator that we used. Um, and there were three words um, at random separated by spaces. And they worked, it worked extremely well. Um, uh, and then uh, when the libraries were contacted, um, we also shared with them um, this transitioning to the new user accounts um, document, which again, so trying to um, cover everything that the library would bump up against as they started using their new um, staff accounts. Oh, go ahead, Jessica. So for instance, how to change your, your password, um, the interface columns that they had 
been used to with the sizing, how, how, to, how to deal with that. Um, how to um, export and import your cataloging templates. Uh, of course, every library wanted to know how to do that. So instructions on how to do that. Um, copy buckets. Um, let's see, is, is there anything else on that one? Keep scrolling. Um, no, I, I thought, could have sworn we had, oh, there it is. Yeah, reports, the re, report templates. Looks like the uh, screenshots didn't come over. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, so your, the report templates, um, how to, um, how to share report, um, report templates, um, because when the old accounts were merged into new accounts, the report templates made it over to just one individual. So you would want to know how to share those report templates um, when, when the accounts were merged. Okay. I'm learning how to do the keyboard shortcuts. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> All right, next slide. All right, and this was just one um, example of uh, John's random password generator. So uh, it, you know, if you if you didn't like it, you just clicked on new password, and then you know you would get another one. Um, Oh, right, Mary's saying selection lists, is uh, acquisition selection lists. Yeah, that's, um, that, that's also uh, had, had, uh, had to be moved over. Um, so, so this, again, like I said, this worked really well. Um, it was a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> you know, you take your fun where you can get it. And coming up with, you know, and some of these um, random passwords were, um, really you know it's just um, surprisingly humorous so um so yeah so we did that for a lot of libraries uh, next slide okay so the staff accounts and passwords were given out over the phone to these test libraries uh you know that got to be a bit tedious so after we got through with this testing phase um we used uh, encrypted Excel documents and sent them to the libraries. And um, then the, the, I would uh, talk to the library director and, and give, her, give her or him the, the password to unlock the document. Next slide. Um, libraries tested for a period, period of one month. The good news is Jessica had done enough of the prep work um, you know, leading up to this um, time, that the, the 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 problems were minor and and hardly we hardly saw any problem at all with these test libraries. And maybe you know maybe there would be like one permission that might have been missing, or or we forgot to add a permission group, you know, to a particular staff account, There's things like that. But it's. It was it was really not a headache at all, um, yeah. And then um, after one month with no issues, the the old staff accounts were merged um, into what the library identified as their, the the new accounts. So uh, and then instructions were provided on how to um, uh, export import the cataloging templates. Usually that was done right up front though when they started using their their new staff accounts they wanted. Their, their cataloging templates. But included in the merge were the report templates, uh, the, the copy buckets, the uh, my lists, acquisition selection lists, and circulations, holds, billings, and items created and edited by the old account um, would now be associated with the new account. So, um, so that was testing. I think that's the end of me. Yes, Carol. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carol Yarrison. I am the Help Desk Coordinator for Bibliomation, and I also do um, circulation training for Bibliomation. Go ahead, Jessica. So this, um, my job was to create the accounts for the um, staff members. So this is an example of one of the forms that would come back to Amy and she would pass it off to me and I would create the individual um, staff members uh, accounts 
so that they could log into Evergreen. You can see where the libraries would identify what permissions they were going to need. Go ahead. So using the first letter of the first name and the full last name, that was the way that we went to create the barcode and the username. Sometimes we ran into problems if the patron had already created a username in that same format. So I'd have to find a different um, username and barcode to use. But using the password generator, we created the password and we use the real name of the staff member. Go ahead. Um, the secondary groups, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about later, we would put in um, as the libraries, uh, what I did was I did them in alphabetical order, which sometimes has had created some issues if they wanted to do cataloging in their first group was acquisitions. Um, and we're still playing with that to see whether it's um, had any real function or any um, mishaps going on with that. Go ahead. Um, we would get rid of the mailing address because for the staff member, it wasn't necessary to have the mailing address. And some staff members don't have an email address either, but we're going back and forth on that. So to be quite honest, um, we have some with and some without email addresses. And for us at, in Connecticut, residency is a requirement for a staff cat. So the libraries have to fill in the residency of the library where the staff member will be working and it should be the same as the home library on the registration form. It is a long list saying that we have 169 towns, but not all towns have their own library and some towns have more than one library. So um, in order to get their perks, quote unquote, from the state library, um, Connecticut is fortunate that they will allow out of town residents to use a library and then the library is compensated um, for that privilege. So after creating the patron record, I would go into other and find the user permission editor and give that patron or that staff member rather permission to work in that particular library. Go ahead, Jessica. So this is just an example of, you know, a staff member at Bethel Public Library. Scroll and find the, the library that they would be uh, working in and then go down to the end of the list and save it. And it is a long list. <laughs> so then I'd go back in and find the patron through using the, um, barcode that I had created and in patron search, find the patron and then bring up the secondary groups and assign the other groups that they would need on the initial creation of the um, staff member, you can only use one permission group. Then you have to go back in and put in the secondary groups later. Okay, Jessica, thank you. So this is just an example of the different user groups that Jessica was talking about earlier. We had five. So um, again, I would put them in an alphabetical order. So it would be acquisitions, catalog or circulation, local user and local workstation. Sometimes it would make a difference as to what the staff member wanted to use. But we, like I said, we're still working on that. All right. I think uh, that's the end of your stuff, Carol, right? It's me I now. think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, kind of going back around to uh, passwords. Uh, once we had started to have staff transitioning to um, these new accounts, um, 
we we really wanted to make sure that you know they weren't giving themselves a four uh, digit password uh, to to log into the client, uh, especially if we were giving that permission to to um, some of the local people. Um, so we what we did was we 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 made a customization for the staff client, and everybody at, was using Zool at this point. Um, but we did do it in both Zool and uh, and the the staff client, um, where um, John kind of embedded his password generator into the uh, patron registration form, and so that meant that we also had that requirement for patrons. So when you clicked on that generate password button, it would give that three word password for everybody now. Um, and uh, so we, we ended up changing the password length requirement for um, people who were changing their, resetting their password through the OPAC. That was kind of the first phase of this. And uh, that, one, that um, kind of went, that went fine. Uh, we didn't get too much pushback from the libraries about that. The board uh, approved that one um, pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and that allowed us to have the longer password requirement for, for the staff. I think they realized the trade-off of that. Um, then we kind of wanted to take it a step further and say, okay, well, this is going all right. So what if we make that requirement for everybody, including new patrons that, that come in? Um, or anybody that, uh, that resets their passwords, even if they're doing it at the, at the desk. And um, we put this before the board, and the first um, reaction that we got to it is that they had a lot of concerns about CERC staff being able to handle this change. Um, they didn't really want their CERC staff writing down a, a three-word password and handing it to the patron. They figured what happens if the patron loses that piece of paper, um, you know, what happens if the staff member writes it down wrong. Uh, there's, there was lots of things that could happen. So. Uh, we listened to those concerns and, you know, there was also concerns about usability of the patron, you know, actually being able to sit down and type a password that was that was that long. So we listened to those concerns and um, we decided not to put it up for a vote at that time, but to come back with a more detailed proposal and um, with some things that might help the staff to to make this change. So uh, what we did uh, was we did a little bit of a, a demonstration for, for the board. And uh, part of this demonstration was the use of this very famous XKCD comic. Uh, and the point of the comic, if, if you haven't seen it before, I feel like mo a lot of people probably have, but um, the, the usual you know, requiring numbers and symbols and capital letters and things, uh, actually makes it hard for people to remember, but very easy for a machine to guess. Uh, so the, the point of this comic is that if you have, you know, four separate words, actually becomes very easy for a person to understand or, or to remember, but more difficult for a machine to guess. And we did a demonstration on this uh, using howsecureismypassword.net. And this actually was first brought to my attention during a sysadmins interest group at the conference. So thank you for, uh, for turning us onto this. So we did, uh, we did, I did a little demonstration of here's me entering four random characters, instantly cracked. And even if I do ones that are different part of the keyboard, uh, you know, very, very easy for a, a computer to uh, kind of crack into that. But if I use, and we decided to go with three words instead of four to make it a little bit more palatable. <laughs> so if I use uh, four random words, uh, 10 billion years to crack that, that password. All right, oops, and control. -Alt. 
So we had to make some changes to the code in order to make this happen. Um, we changed the, the uh, password hint here. Uh, we, rec we, t we said, hey, if you're updating your password, and this is it once, once a user is logged into my account, um, you need to, it needs to be 12 characters in length, and uh, you can use a phrase, uh, you can use uh, space, it, I don't think it says you can use spaces, but you can use a, a quote or, a, or lyrics from your favorite song. We also changed um, the wording that happens, the, so the password hint. So when you click on my account and you go to log in, uh, it says, if this is your first time logging in, please click here to set up your password. And this is using the same form as it would be using if you clicked on forgot your password. So this takes it out of the library staff's hands entirely and makes it a self-serve thing. It's something that patrons are used to uh, with a lot of their accounts. It does require that they have an email, but again, if you wanna use an account online, it's uh, pretty common for an email to be required. So uh, we added that wording to, to that template. Uh, we also changed the password reset form here so that we had a more of a hint on uh, this is when you can expect the email to arrive because we've got it set to run every half an hour. So it could be up to that length of time before they actually receive the email. Um, and if uh, you've never signed in before, we found it so that um, when those patrons started using this a lot more, uh, they were kind of confused about the difference between a barcode and a username. Uh, so we had to tell them the number on your library card and uh, we had to make it clearer that they didn't need to enter both because if they were entering some username that hadn't been used before, um, Evergreen would go, I don't know what that is and they would never end up getting their email. And uh, so some of the more technical changes that we made to make this happen, uh, this is information that uh, John uh, kindly provided to me uh, so that we could share it with you guys. Um, we had changed the password regex in the uh, account Perl module so that it would be, so that the new password has a minimum of 12 characters and no other requirements, so no capital letters, no symbols. Um, we also modified um, some of the, the JavaScript code so that a different password generation program was used to create that three word uh, random password. Um, and and um, the key there was that we had disabled that the last four of the phone number uh, was, and was turned off. And um, the code that John used to generate the password is a, is a Perl script that, that he wrote that kind of creates those words from a dictionary file. Uh, some naughty words had to be removed <laughs> to make it uh, usable for public consumption. Um, occasionally, we'll still see a phrase that's kind of questionable, but you know, we tell people if that happens to just regenerate the password and uh, no harm, no foul. <laughs> um, and uh, John did say that if anybody's interested in that, he would share it. Um, so any password generator could be used as long as it's delivered to Evergreen correctly, John said. And he used a CG wrapper around the Perl split, uh, script to deliver the password to Evergreen as a raw HTTP string. Uh, he said that that could probably be changed so the output del is delivered directly to Evergreen, but he thought that that was the quickest and easiest way to get it done at the time. And now we're on to our question slide. Uh, and I, I did want to, uh, you know, highlight my other project that, <laughs> that I did this year. <laughs> so this is my son on the day he was born. And this is him last week. So that, that's Philip. And he was going to come to the live Evergreen conference with me. So I thought, you know, this is probably the closest you guys might get to, to actually meeting and seeing him at least this year. So there he is. <laughs> Jessica, I have something that I wanted to add that I neglected to say. 
Um, if we had staff members who worked at two different libraries, we had to create two separate accounts. Yes. One for each of the libraries. And the other thing that we ran into um, was that staff members uh, would accidentally merge their personal account mm -hmm. with their staff account that we created. So um, in order to get a buy that, we put in the uh, capital letters of staff after their last name with hopes that they would not merge the two. Right, and uh, we actually did have to, you reminded me about that too, uh, we had to add the word staff to the end of the of the last name, uh, and we did that for all of the staff accounts so that right. they could know which account was their, was their staff account when they were looking in patron search. Right. Thank you, everyone. I think he's cute too, <laughs> but I'm a little biased. <laughs> he is adorable. Oh, good question. Why would you not want them to use their personal account for work? You know, that was something that I, I brought up, I think, in an early meeting is like we could have them use their their personal or, or their, you know, their PL staff account and add stuff to it. Um, but some do actually. Okay. <laughs> I see that, you know, I see, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I've seen them check out stuff to their, their staff accounts too. Yeah. Um, right. But I, I don't know, we, we thought that uh, some libraries would want to keep it separate and it might be confusing to kind of untangle some of that stuff, I think, I think was the reasoning for that. Yeah. Right, Diane. Um, that was something that we had to explain to the staff members that yes, um, their staff accounts are actually patron accounts. And yes, they do get that confused. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, I think we're pretty much at time, unless you, um, whether there's another question that came in in Q&A, did you encounter any significant resistance from libraries in regards to the changes or resistance mm. to doing the testing? If so, how did you make the case for this change? Mm. Sorry, say it again. <laughs> sure. Did you encounter any significant resistance from libraries in regard to the changes or resistance to doing the testing? If so, how did you make the case for this change? Are we talking about uh, for the, the staff accounts at this point? I would guess so. Yeah. So the, I, I think we, we did have a bit of, of, um, of resistance to this because uh, we that had been, uh, you know, there, there were, especially for the small libraries where uh, they were used to kind of making it simple, you know, they had, they had older staff members. Um, so I think the, the kind of uh, compromise that we came up with for a lot of those staff is that, all right, well, if you don't, if you want to have a, a shared account, let's set you up with this limited user account so that you know they have the ability to do the minimum that you want them to do anyway. And um, that, that's been working out pretty well. And I think that um, that uh, kind of got over the resistance. Jessica, Mary yeah. just pointed out that we, we focused on that you could do change operator too yes. and then you have to keep logging out and logging back mm -hmm. in. Right. That made a difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, most of the libraries didn't know that that change operator feature even existed until we mm -hmm. pointed it out to them. Because why would they? They were always using the same, the same uh, account. <laughs> I think somebody pointed out too that, uh, that the three word password, um, you know, uh, opens up to dictionary attacks. So that's something for us to consider going forward, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right.
right, thank you all. That was really interesting. Um, and